All right, so today I want to show you the best practices for filling molds. These are molds from the Freak Mode Dabble Dark collection, which are available exclusively on my website, freakmode.com. I'll link it in the description box. And this video is intended to go along with the release of the mold so that if you were to get one and you want to know how to fill it, how to get beautiful cat plastic, how to get, how to get nice coloring, all of that, this video will go through all the processes and materials that I use to get nice prosthetics. So I'm starting with cleaning the molds. I've got isopropyl alcohol and a paper towel. I'm just making sure that any of the past silicon release cat plastic powder is just getting wiped away for a fresh start. So to release the mold, releasing is very important. Um, it will make sure that if you have any silicon go over the edge, it's not gonna bond to your prosthetic and then also make it really easy to pull your prosthetic out of the mold rather than it getting caught in there. A couple of different releases you can use. Um, sometimes I use spray releases if I'm just being quick and lazy, but a really good release, really cheap, easy to find release is Vaseline. If you've got a brand new mold that you haven't run, I'd recommend putting Vaseline over it first and letting it sink in. You can brush the Vaseline straight into the mold and just really work it in. It is quite thick. I'm sure everyone knows the consistency of Vaseline. So what I like to do is get a little bit of Shellite or naphtha. If you're in the US, UK, it's basically lighter fluid. It, it's pretty stinky, but just in a little bit in a cup, you can use it to thin down your Vaseline into a, into a liquid, basically, kind of like a liquid Vaseline. And then this just tends to flow over the mold a lot quicker. You don't have the really clumpy bits of Vaseline to get stuck in any detail or worry about that impeding any detail. And it just seems to make it sink into the mold a lot faster. So you don't have to use Shellite, but I do like using Shellite. And then once I've got that, you can work it into the mold with your brush. Just like to go over the sides, just in case you get any silicon over the sides, it'll just help to clean up the mold later. Especially details in the skin graft here, very important to release in there so that doesn't grab and become a nightmare to demold. I just like to work it in there just to make sure that it's not caught in any of the details, any of the little undercuts. It's just nicely soaked into the mold. Okay, now that my molds are nice and released, I'm gonna get the cap plastic ready. There's lots of different brands and kinds of cap plastic now. One of the originals was Baldi's. The one I've had really good reviews for is the uh, um, Bald Effects for the clear cap plastic. And you can get it in this form now where it hasn't got the acetone, it's dry. So you can get it internationally shipped here to Australia, which is awesome for me. And I can put this into acetone and melt it down. I haven't tried that one yet, but I am excited to after all the positive feedback I've read online about it. For today, I'm gonna to use the Scotty's one because I've already got a mix of that. Um, for that one, I put 20% of the cap plastic and then 80% uh, acetone and then thin it down into this mix. This is a nail gene bottle. They're usually acetone proof, so I use these to keep my mixes in. You can also brush it on. If you were to brush it on, I'd recommend a thick brush. You'd maybe want to use something kind of like this, a thick end, mix it up 50% um, 50% cap plastic, 50% acetone, and then you can just brush it on and try and keep the brush moving so it doesn't pull um, or like puddle in the center. Benefit of using a spray gun is you get a nice even coating and it dries really quickly. Um, you do have to have it thinner though and, and generally do more coats because of that. I usually do about three. Downside of spraying is you need the spray gun, you need the um, air tank pump thing, and then you also need a respirator because this is emitting, the airbrushes emit tiny little specks of plastic into the air and you don't wanna be breathing that in. So, because I'm doing a few, I'm gonna use like my industrial size setup. So I've got this like big air gun, which will make light work of this. You can also use little airbrushes like the Pashi H is pretty good for this. Um, so I'm just gonna talk through what I'm doing now and then put on my respirator. So I'm going to fill up my air gun. I'm going to spray three coats over these. I'm gonna rotate the board so that um, I get coverage from different directions, which will help ensure there's no gaps where it's not hitting that are going to tear later on. Just a nice even coverage. Um, and then I'm going to take my mask off and talk to you again.
The thickness of your cat plastic is really important, so I do recommend that you always test it before moving on to the next step. So you don't want it to be too thin. If it's too thin when you demold it, it's going to fall apart, it's going to have holes through it, it's not going to have the integrity that you need it to have. Um, so to check that it's not too thick, you're going to want something sharp. Go out onto this outside border, outside this flashing line, because this border here you don't need. Don't do it in the detail. But on the outer edge, find an outer edge, get something sharp, and try and pick it up. And if you can pick it up, and it maintains like a straight uh, up and down bubble, I guess. Let me use the other camera to show you a close up. So you wanna grab it, lift it up, and if it lifts up without breaking, then you know it's ready to go. If it falls apart and you've got little holes coming through, you do wanna spray another layer or two until it is holding itself together. Um, the other thing to be aware of is going too thick. The first time I made my pieces, I made the cat plastic too thick. Um, so you, you want to keep doing layers until it only just holds together and then stop. If you do too many layers and it's really thick, when you go to apply it, it's going to have this thick coating over it, which is going to look like plasticky. It's going to crinkle weirdly, have a weird shine, and it's going to be harder to dissolve the edges. So the goal is to have it really quite nice and thin so it's easily blendable and it doesn't show up too much on the skin or on the prosthetic, but thick enough that it will hold its shape and not have holes through it. So it's that Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold. And I'm gonna mix up my silicon. So let's move the camera to focus on here. So I have some scales here. So I'm going to start by mixing up a pale tone to put in the center of this hand and of the skin graft. So it is optional whether you want to have it be just one tone or have multiple tones throughout it. So I'm going to start by showing you how to do dual tones in a prosthetic and then we're going to move on to doing just the single tones. So for this one, I'm going to run it in the um, pale flesh tone, which is not that one. So to start with, I'm going to run it in the pale flesh tone and then I'm going to add a little bit of white pigment in there. So we're gonna mix up just a small amount because we just need it to be in the center. So I've got my Platzel Gel 10A in the squeezy bottle to make it just quick and easy to, to weigh it out. So let's do, let's do like five grams of A and we'll do five grams of B, Platzel Gel 10B. So I've got 10 grams of A and B. I'm gonna do 17 grams of Deadna. So it's gonna be 170% deadened, which is my preference. Cool, so keep in mind, as soon as this is all touching, it's gonna to start curing. You have about 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes, depending on how hot it is outside. So I'm gonna grab a little bit of this white pigment. Usually silicon pigments are very, very pigmented. So you just need like the tiniest bit. So we'll put a drop of the pale flush term, drop of the white. And we'll see what that looks like. I think it just needs a little bit more opacity. So now that we've got that concoction mixed up, I'm going to start by putting it in the center of these two prosthetics. Let's get this focused in. And I'm just gonna focus this where I want it to go. So for this, I'm gonna kind of follow the stitches up here. And then I don't think there was much, just from my reference photo, I don't think there was much paleness on the sides. It will help to have it down the center because that's what we're gonna be painting pink and it'll just make it stand out more. I don't think there was too much on the bottom either. It's mostly that top section, which had a paleness um, from it having this moist healing thing happening so basically they just put a moist bandage and it make the skin made the skin basically if you've been in the bath for like a month <laughs> makes the skin pale and wrinkly and then let's do the skin graft so I just want this to be a thin coating just where the skin graft section is which is this raised area so generally if it's raised in the mold it's going to be lower in the finished piece but the fact that it's raised in the mold can make it a little bit trickier to keep it in place because gravity will want to pull it off to the sides. So for this one, I find just a thin amount works, works easier to keep it in place. And then what I like to do is just clean up any areas where I've gone 
too far over the sides of some cotton tips. So for example, you can see over here, I didn't want that to be a pale color. Um, just go around the edges and just be gentle with this because I have accidentally pulled up the cap plastic while doing this by putting too much pressure. So you don't want to put on so much pressure that you're tearing up cap plastic or anything. I also want to clean up this edge just to make that a little bit tighter. And clean up any spillage over here so that the silicon is only where I want it to be. And as it cures, it's going to keep moving because it's a liquid or gel, I guess it's a gel. So you can just keep coming and checking that it hasn't spilled anywhere that you don't want it to be. Okay, I think that's looking pretty good for now. And I'll just come back and keep checking on that every few minutes and just cotton tipping away areas that I don't want to have it be there. Okay, and I'm gonna focus on pigmenting one piece, just all one color. Another thing I should mention is when you're filling, it is helpful to have something like this to make sure your table is level. You know, this table definitely is not, which means that the prosthetic is gonna be on a slant and because the silicon's a gel, it's gonna to wanna to go with that slant, so. Let me just quickly make this more level. Cool, that's looking a lot more level now. So the silicon that I prefer to use to fill molds is Platsil Gel 10. It's kind of one of the industry standards for what people fill with. You can get different softnesses, different hardnesses. Is that the word hard? Different softness and hardness within the Platsil series. Sometimes people use Smooth On as well, which is a different kind of a uh, silicon setup, but uh, I'm gonna use gel 10. And so you've got uh, an A and a B, which I have decanted into these squeezy bottles just to make it easier for myself um, when I'm filling molds, A and B. And what happens is when A and B touch each other, they catalyze each other and they go from a gel into a solid. So it's all a chemical reaction, so it doesn't matter whether you have a massive mold or a tiny mold, they're gonna take the exact same amount of time to cure because it is just a chemical reaction at that point. So I could fill a five kilogram one or a five gram one. They're both gonna take about half an hour to cure. If it is a warmer day, the heat does make the silicon catalyze quicker. It might be more like a 20 minute thing. If it's a colder day, it does make it catalyze slower. It might be like a 45 minute thing until you can demold um, until it's a solid. In terms of mixing time, I try and mix it pretty much as quick as possible, a couple of minutes, and then you'll have five to 10 minutes to get it into the molds, to get it scraped and to get it cotton tipped um, before it starts to gel, which is the point where you wanna stop touching it, stop messing with it, because that's when you can damage the prosthetic beyond repair. So you wanna work with it when it's a liquid, five to 10 minutes, depending on how hot it is. If it's a really hot day, you can put your, <laughs> you can put your silicons in the fridge to make them slow down the cure. Um, you can also uh, add something to the silicon which is a platsil retarder, which will just make the silicon um, cure slower. You can add, I think it's up to 4%, 2% is kind of a standard amount, 2% of the total weight. So it's just a small amount and that will um, prolong your cure time, especially if you're filling lots of molds at once, you might wanna add that so you can get them all filled, scraped and cotton tipped before it gels. It will just be longer until you can spray the back with cat plastic. Um, the silicon is a platinum silicon, so it's totally skin safe. Um, and it is what they use in the medical business as well to make medical prostheses for people that are like missing fingers or missing ears or whatever it is, they will use the platinum silicons for that as well. So we're going to color them with silicon pigments. And then on top of the silicons, you've got a thing called Deadna. Um, sometimes it's called Smith's prosthetic Deadna or just Deadna. Um, so this is my, uh, my Deadna here, which is what the D is for. And Deadna is basically a silicon oil. It's very thin. Thick. It's very viscous. I don't know if you can see it in here, but it is a silicon oil. And what this will do is it will add softness to the silicon. So it'll take it from something that's quite hard to something that's quite soft and like malleable and will move really nicely with the skin. Um, so if you want to make something a little bit hard, maybe kind of like a keloid scar, you will put um, one part silicon, A and B together. So if it's like 10 grams, five grams of each, it's always a 50, 50, 50 to 50 mix for A and B. So you've got 10 grams total of silicon, you put in 10 grams of deadener, that equals 100% deadener. 
um, and then that's going to be kind of hard, maybe like a keloid scar. For the stuff that I'm doing here for my prosthetics, I want it to be quite soft, so I'll put in a lot more deadener than I put in silicon, which is kind of weird, but that's how it works. So I'll put in 170% deadener to my silicon. So say if I put in 5 of A, 5 of B, I got 10 grams of silicon. If I put in 17 grams of deadener, that's going to be 170%. So what I usually do is I weigh out my A and B, and I'm bad at maths, and then I go, cool, my A and B together is 45 grams, whatever it is. What is 45 times 1.7? And then that's going to give me the amount of deadener. So I will show you what I mean. The other thing that we use for this is uh, silicon pigments. This is to color the prosthetics to make them whatever skin tone we wish. Um, this is called intrinsically coloring. And then when you paint it with alcohol paints, that's called extrinsically coloring. And you usually do a combination of both to get the prosthetics to match skin tones exactly. But the closer you can get it with intrinsic coloring, the easier your job's gonna be when you're applying it. And they've also got flocking, which is basically little tiny nylon powder. And this just helps to break up the skin tone, add a little bit of blue and, I usually use blue and red. You can use just red or you can use none of it, doesn't really matter, but it's just like a really cheap, quick and effective way just to break up the skin tone to make it look slightly more realistic. So I usually add that in as well. These tins I've had for five years. <laughs> they last so long because I'm just using a tiny bit at a time. So let's mix up a pale skin tone. I'm gonna start with my A. I'm gonna be filling uh, four molds that are quite large. So I'm gonna do a larger batch. So I'm gonna add some retarder to this batch. Oh, do I need it? I've got four. No, I think I'll be fine. I'm not gonna add it, I'll be fine. It's, it's a cold day here. So I'm gonna start with my part A. And I always recommend starting with A first because A and B look identical. So if you've just got some gel in here and you've started weighing it out and you go and get distracted and you come back and you're like, oh, is that A or B? Uh, if you put in double Bs, cause you're like, oh, maybe it was probably an A, let's put in B again. If you're gonna end up with a gel that never cures, you're gonna have to clean this really sticky gel out of your mold. It's gonna be a nightmare. Always start with A, that way you always know I have put A in Therefore, if I've started mixing up something, it's always going to be A. And then I'll put in B, and then you're never going to have uncured silicon. So let's measure out. Let's see. I'm going to do some maths on my phone quickly. So if I were to do 40 grams total of silicon, and then times it by 1.7. Oops, that's going to be 68. That's going to be about 100 grams. No, I need more than that. Let's do about 40 grams of A. And then if I have, it'll be 80 total. 80 times 1.7 is 136 plus 80. So it's going to be a batch of 216. Yeah, that should work. So I'm going to put in um, 40 grams of B as well. If you do the maps first, you can always put the deadener in in between. And that way you've got this little um, surface layer between the A and the B, which gives you a little bit more time before the catalyzation starts happening because they're not touching. Versus if I put B straight in, it's going to be touching the A and it's going to start catalyzing right away. But for today, I'm just going to do A, B, D. That's what I normally do. Um, but there is the option to put deadener in first. I just find the maths easier just to do, I've got 40 of this. I'm going to do 40 of this. It's going to make me have 80. And then I'll just go and times 80 by 1.7 for my just normal skin mixture softness. You can go up to 200% deadener if you're doing something really soft, like an old age makeup or like around the neck or around the mouth, we need a lot more movement. Um, but for this stuff, just wounds on the body, body in general. 170 is great. So 80 times 1.7 is 136. So I'm gonna tear this to zero. I'm gonna put in 136 grams of deadener. And then I'm going to put in my little bit of flocking. Get my pale flesh turn, which is this one. So it wants to come out. This one I've diluted with some silicon oil just to make it thinner so it's easier to weigh it out. Because I got a big cup, I'm just gonna let it all out. So this is about double what I would be putting if it was straight from the mold life thing, which is a lot thicker and a lot more concentrated. Cool, so I've got a big cup. I wanna make sure it's definitely stirred all the way through and that there's no 
part A sitting at the bottom, which is just unmixed in, won't cure. So a way of getting um, like a good amount of pigmentation, eventually, um, I mean, eventually you could learn to do it by weight and always have the same weight every single time, just, to, you know, like 2% or like whatever it is. Um, but if you're eyeballing it, if you're new to it, you can do a little black dot on a mixing stick like so. Let's zoom in on this mixing stick. And then you can dip it into the silicon. And then when you pull it out, you can see how, oh, come on, camera focus. You can see how much of that's showing through. So that's quite transparent. What you want it to look like, what you're aiming for is the same transparency of veins coming through your skin tone. So I'm gonna add a little bit more of this pigment. And that might be too much, we'll see. So if you put in not enough, it's gonna look translucent and waxy. And if you put in too much, it's just gonna look too opaque and fake, kind of like, um, I'm gonna say cake face foundation, you know, where you're just like, whoa. Okay, let's test our pigmentation again. Through here. So you can see it's starting to come through just a little bit, but it's quite, um, quite opaque now. So that's a good level. Cool, so now we're gonna fill the molds. Let's go over to the molds. So what I usually like to do is get it into all the molds first before scraping if I'm doing multiple molds. And you do wanna overfill just to make sure it is Definitely got enough um, of your silicon in there and then scrape it back. If you underfill it and then scrape it back, there's gonna be areas which might be underfilled, sunken in, and then it won't have all the detail that you want. So I've got my jewel tone ones here. So now that that has cured enough, I can put this on top. Make sure you fill in all of the flashing as well. If you run out part way through, you can just go back and start scraping back into the cup and then you can finish filling. So let's scrape off this guy up here. So I usually start halfway up. And if you keep your scraper totally vertical while scraping, you can easily put stuff back into the cup. So I'll show you an example of this one. I start halfway just so I've only got half of the, if I do the whole thing, I've got all of the silicon. So start with half the silicon, scrape it, and then just keep it vertical and it will all cling onto that scraper. Oh, I lie, I messed up that one. Usually it works, sometimes it gets messy. Silicon can get very messy, don't, use, don't wear your good clothes while you're doing this. Cool, and now I've got extra in my cup, so I can go ahead and just keep filling this guy. I usually fill them all, let some of the bubbles dissipate. Um, just because I'm not using a degasser, there'll be a little bit of bubbles in there. Degassers are a couple of hundred dollars, which is why I don't have one. So this one, I think I might have overscraped a little bit. Um, what I might do with this one, actually, do one last scrape top to bottom just to get clean edges. And then I wanna overfill this section here, just cause I feel like that one is one of pretty much the only ones in the collection that just benefits from just a tiny bit extra overfill, those really thin details like that. And then for this big guy, I need like a giant <laughs> spatula. Let's go half and half. Got a couple of different sized um, of these, um, basically they're paint scrapers, I think, or metal filling knives. A couple of different sizes for different molds. Makes it easy. The amount of pressure that you put in there is important. So you should do half, half, just to get extra silicon. And then for a final scrape, just to get it nice and clean, I'll start from the top. And you wanna put enough pressure that you get a clean scrape, 
so that all these edges, well, you don't want any silicon uh, matte, no longer shiny from the silicon. But you don't want to put so much pressure that you indent it and make the mold underfilled or that you scratch the cap plastic and cause, te cause tears in the cap plastic. So it's kind of like a Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold. You've got to do it a few times to get the feel for it. One of the benefits of our molds is that they are a sure 40 hardness, which means they're quite a hard silicon. So when you're pressing down on them, it's, it's a lot harder to press down than it would be on like a sure 20 mold. And that means that it's going to be harder to scrape so hard that you underfill the mold just because they don't have a lot of give to them. Oops, got a bit more that way. Sometimes I change the direction if I'm feeling like I'm not getting it all. What I was saying is one of the benefits of our molds being a sure 40 firmness is that it makes it a lot harder to push it down so far that it becomes like really underfilled. Um, which then means that your molds will come out looking more accurate to the sculpts. So they're going to be mysteriously thinner. There will always be a little bit of underfilling with flat molds because that's just the reality of a flat mold, but the Sure 40 hardness definitely helps with that. And then in terms of, yeah, not scratching up the cat plastic, that's just practice. You do it once and then you're like, oh, that's, that's too hard. Okay, cool. I'm not going to do that again. So what I'm doing now is I've grabbed some cotton tips and I'm going to cotton tip the edges. So the purpose of this is we've got this little tiny edge, this um, kind of uh, this straight line around the edge is called flashing. And just within this flashing, there's a section that's ideally about half a centimeter, five millimeters or so uh, deep, about the depth of like the, the head of a cotton tip really. Um, is ideally a section like that, which has no silicate on it, it's just cat plastic, and this is gonna be our blending edge. So when we put acetone on this edge, it's going to blend it seamlessly into the skin. And if we have a really thin amount of silicon on here from filling the molds, it's not gonna blend out. The silicon doesn't dissolve with anything. So we're gonna double check that there's no silicon around that edge so that when we glue it down and we are blending out our edges, this edge is gonna be beautiful and blend away. So what I usually do is I get a cotton tip. I'll go around each edge twice. Um, try and keep that edge free from silicon about the width of the cotton tip head. If you get too much silicon on your cotton tip, just throw it away and get a fresh one. And I'm just gonna follow this edge around twice. And if you've got the right light, so I suggest you get a lamp, or I've got box lights up here, or sunlight from a window. Um, get natural light reflecting on your prosthetic and then you can clearly see if it's shiny or if it's matte it'll be shiny if it's got silicon on there and as you wipe away the silicon it's going to become matte so if you position the lights correctly or position yourself with good lights it will make it a whole lot easier to see what you're doing for the cotton tipping round and sometimes um, if the mold is a little bit unstable if this um, you know table has made it like a go more to this side if I haven't balanced it out properly. You might gouge into it and find there's one edge which you can just see like a very clearly defined silicon edge here. Um, you don't want that. So if you have that, you can wipe away that edge to make it clean again. And then just very delicately cotton tip at this edge just to feather it out. So you've still got that defined edge that's just cat plastic, but there's not like a, a straight line through the silicon next to it, which is gonna show up when you apply it. So you can feather out or feather in depending on how much of a line you've got. Usually feathering out towards the edge works a little bit better. So I tend to soften things that way. That way when you, you are applying it, you still have that edge that's just cat plastic. It will dissolve, it'll look nice. And then any part that got over flooded isn't gonna look harsh next to it. It's just gonna be feathered out. So you should be able to see clearly what I'm talking about with the skin um, the crusty stitches mold just because I have definitely overfilled it so when I go around this edge you're going to see that's going to be like a harsh silicon edge there so oops and if you go into the flashing just check your cotton tip so I'm going to do my normal thing of going around it twice before I feather it so that's the first time and then I just like to double check Go around it a second time. Okay. 
I usually allow myself a few cotton tips per each mold just in case that happens and then for this thick edge um, it's kind of oh god I'm just not doing well today for this thick edge here I'm just gonna gently feather that out gently feather out this side and this edge as well needed a little bit of feathering and that should just help soften it now I've got everything in scraped it got nice edges now it's just a waiting game I'm gonna wait for the silicon to cure I'm gonna give it about half an hour in today's weather and then I'm gonna come back down and then you could just like touch the wet silicon on the table or in the cups or whatever just to see if it is or isn't cured um, it will be sticky but it won't move so if I touch this right now and it like clearly moves that's clearly still wet versus the one I, I ran at the beginning this one here that one you can see is a bit more gelled but it's still moving what you're after is touching it and it being sticky but it not moving at all then you know that it's cured and then after it's cured you can spray the back of it with cat plastic um, so I'm gonna leave, leave it for half an hour come back and then we'll do that last spray for spraying the back I usually do a light coat over everything first just a little mist um, so there's something for the second coat to grab onto and then I do a second coat that has more coverage that's more kind of wetting the whole area and then I will leave that to dry um, you can usually demold after you know after that cat plastic is dry but I do prefer to leave it overnight if possible and demold it the next day I found that when I leave it overnight I get a much nicer cat plastic the cat plastic just seems a lot smoother and a lot stronger um, so it's easier to get away with thinner cat plastic edges if you leave it overnight and it just if you demold it straight away I find the edges look a bit more stretched out um, I'll, I'll see if I can find a photo to put in here to show like visually the difference between the two so if you can leave it overnight for best results and then when it comes to demolding um, a lot of studios like using translucent powder I just use baby powder but if you have something like the neutral set or any kind of translucent powder I've seen RCMA you no know, color powder used as well um, some of those different translucent powders can work quite nicely for demolding and what you want to do is you want to put some of the powder on the back of the prosthetic first uh, it is important to use powder on both the front and the back uh, what I've seen happen is the cat plastic if it folds over and touches itself and it is unpowdered the cat plastic um, is still quite sticky it can stick to itself and then when you try and pull it apart it ends up tearing the prosthetic so you just want to make sure everything's powdered that it's not flopping over and touching itself when it's unpowdered or else you could have cat plastic stuck to itself and then when you try and pull it apart you rip a hole in the prosthetic so I've just got a powder brush and I will just put this powder all over the back of the prosthetics first and one thing I also have started doing is getting a pair of scissors and cutting off any of this um, extra, cat, extra cat plastic around the edge so obviously you need this edge around the mold or else this flashing would just pour off into nothing like you needed this but then once you're done with it I prefer to cut it off just so you have need a prosthetic when you're dealing with it and so this plastic can't flop over stick to this cat plastic here cause you problems when you're storing it or transporting it you don't need it anymore so it's just easy to cut that off so you can either cut it off while it's still in the mold or you can cut it off afterwards you've demolded it um, either or works for that so if you're going to cut it off while it's in the mold I usually just lift it at the edges like this or if you want to do it afterwards what you can do is lift up the prosthetic from the edge and I usually have a pile of powder next to me ready to go so you can powder the underside as you demold it so that it doesn't stick to itself do you have any areas that get stuck you just want to get your thumbs in there and you can use your fingers to help push out any areas that might be giving you problems the only place I wouldn't want to put fingertip pressure on is the cap plastic itself because that's where it's quite thin but any part that you have silicon you can push out the fingertips And sometimes when I'm getting close to the edge, I will just quickly peel up the rest of it 
and then I will place the prosthetic down and just give it a good powder. So if you want to cut up the plastic this way, what you can do is just lift up the plastic like this and then trim it from that edge. And then when you are finished, you should have a prosthetic piece which looks something like this. If you can see, we've got our thin cat plastic edges and our thin silicon edges and then all the silicon detail. That's what the back looks like. We can usually get a board, like a foam board, and then we'll put some kind of plastic over it so it's got a little bit of protection from sticking to the board. I don't usually throw them on top of each other like this. It's best if you just have one place for each thing. So I've got to get a second board now. Put a thin layer of plastic over it and then store that. And then you can pin them if you need them to keep straight. And I'll show you the proof between the two-tone and the monotone skin graft. And this is the hand piece demolded. Do you see the two turned in that? Cool, so that's how I run the prosthetics. Best practices for cat plastic, coloring, filling, cotton tipping, and demolding. And I'll come back up for another video about how I suture and staple them. And then, of course, all the application videos as well. Thank you so much for watching.